you would be here and join us this Sunday. A few announcements um, for you is Beyond Sunday uh, will be happening this Wednesday, uh, as it does every Wednesday, 5.45 to 7 p.m. There will be a gluten-free option at dinner this week um, for those of you um, that need that. Um, the next announcement is today at 7 p.m. in the table, we are having pie with the pastors. And so it's an awesome, yeah, someone's excited. Um, that's a great opportunity to come enjoy some pie, get to know our pastors, get to know our church, how you can be more involved. Um, invite you tonight to join that at 7 p.m. in the table. If you don't know where the table is, that's the Starbucks looking room at the other end of the church. The next thing um, is that you can join Pastor Devin on Friday, May the 3rd for a retreat at 6.30 p.m. in the social hall. We have a parents' night out Friday, May 10th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. We will have nursery available for that as well. You're gonna to go to gbumc.life to register your student, okay? So um, Friday, May the 10th, 6.30 to 8.30, we're gonna have putt-putt set up all throughout the church. Hope your kids can come and join us for that. Two more really quickly is Vacation Bible School registration is now open. You can go to our website, which is www.greatbridgeumc.com. To register, go to the children's page and you'll see the link for that. And then lastly, we are in need of some Friday afternoon Agape volunteers. And so um, once again, you'll go to our website, greatbridgeumc.com, click on Agape, and you can sign up to volunteer there. Why don't you stand up this morning, say hello to your neighbor, tell them you're glad they're here. Let's begin to worship.
Hallelujah. We'd like to invite our children to come down and join me. Parents, once again, for Parents Night Out, the link that you are looking for to register your child is gbumc.life. So, yes. Good morning, Jonah. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Hi, what's up? Would you join with me as we pray over our children? Lord, we have been called to a, a thankfulness. And gosh, there's so much to be thankful for. We thank you for this day. We thank you for waking us up. We thank you for getting us here. Lord Jesus, we are expectant in the life of our children of what you're going to do as they get ready to head back to Sunday school. Pray that you would stir up in them a love for you, Lord. That would be a blessing to this church and a blessing to this community, a blessing to all of the earth. So, Lord, move in their hearts this morning. Bless their teachers as they teach. It's for your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
ask that you just bless every person in this room. I bless their family and just let them, let them walk and feel your presence with them this week. We love you. Amen. church our first lesson is from deuteronomy chapter 6 the first uh, nine verses then we'll follow that with second thessalonians chapter 2 verses 13 through 17 here are these words i'm a little hot i believe i mean i'm not hot but you know it's mike's hot so now this is the commandment i'll stop Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy. So that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God with all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear thou after, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you, so that you may multiply greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord, the God of our ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And now these words. But we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits of salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the, church, in the truth. For this purpose he called you through our proclamation of the good news, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Tradition, if you have watched any of the Masters the last three days, and if you watch it this afternoon, you'll certainly hear a lot about tradition. It is referred to as a tradition unlike any other. In the musical Fiddler on the Roof, one of the most well-known songs is about the roles and the expectations of people in the family, and each stanza is followed by the refrain with the word, and I'm not going to sing it, but you know it, Tradition. And it's offered over and over again. Now, if I ask you about one of your family's traditions, chances are you'll speak of a time-honored tradition around Christmas that has guided your experience of Christmas. And usually they're filled with all kinds of traditions. We speak of traditional service and contemporary service as if the contemporary service doesn't have any traditions. But guess what? Over time, every contemporary service has their traditions. We have our order. We do certain things. Traditions are important. We have them in our homes. We have them in school. We have them in the life of the church. We have them in the communities in which we live. And there is power that comes with the passing down of these traditions. The Israelites knew how important it was for the next generation to learn the story of God's deliverance of the people from bondage of slavery to freedom. And during the Passover Seder meal, it is customary for the youngest, even today, they'll ask the question. And one of the questions is called the the Manishtana. 
asking, why is this night different than all other nights? And then the story is told. The story is passed down. Children learn the importance of asking the questions and learning their story, learning who they are as a people of God. And parents and grandparents, they find great joy in the sharing and answering the question as they share the story, a story that has long shaped the people. It is a night of remembrance, a night of sharing traditions that have long shaped who they are. And it was during that meal, that traditional Passover meal, when Jesus took wine and bread, instead of offering the same traditional words of remembrance, he offered new words. And today, when we share in Holy Communion like we have the last two Sundays, we're not just doing it because it's the tradition of the church. Now, the tradition is we do it first Sunday of the month. and that's another sermon. But the reason we, we do it once a month, but that's tradition. But we, it's not a tradition in the life of the church only. It is a way of remembrance. It's a way of celebrating the presence of Christ when we gather together around the table. In our Old, lesson, Old Testament lesson today, we heard the Shema, and included in the Shema is the command to love God with all of who you are and the encouragement to keep the words the commandments to keep them and to do what to recite them to your children and talk about them when you're home when you're away when you lie down and when you rise see their power there's power in the words and of the story it comes not it comes not just when the stories are what the stories are about yes there's power in the love of God but this power comes in sharing the words to the next generation. And if you cease to share the story, if you cease to pass it down, the story gets lost. The story goes away. See, time-honored traditions, they're what? When they're passed down, they're taught from one generation to the next. And what's taught are the stories that go with the stories that shape who we are. We understand who we are by the stories that we live into. This is true in our families. It's important to teach the next generation the family stories that reveal what? That reveal character and encourage perseverance when facing obstacles today. Stories that reveal you're not the only ones who have faced challenges and overcome them. Same is true in visionary companies that retain core values as the company will shift with different CEOs and different products that they offer when the changing of times. The times might change, but the values are part of the tradition that are panned down. Great visionary companies that are built to last, they thrive through the decades because they know, they know their story, they know who they are. Jim Collins writes about such companies, they continually remind themselves of the crucial distinction between what is core and non-core, between what should never change and what should be open to change between what is sacred and what is not. Tradition does not mean we keep doing things just because we've always done them and that's, who, that's what we do. We just keep traditions. A church may cease to exist or be relevant by holding on traditions that might be empty if we're not open to the Holy Spirit who's leading us to offer fresh expressions of what? Of our story, of our old-time religion. Perhaps you've heard that the most common phrase uttered in a church that it is in decline is, we've never done it that way before, or we've always done it this way. Traditions kept for the sake of traditions may hold form, but if we're not careful, we lose the substance and the meaning behind them, robbing them of their true power if we're simply carrying them out without giving them much thought. We just do this because that's what we do. Perhaps you're familiar with the story of a person preparing to soak a country ham in a large pot, and she saws off the bone at the end. Ask, why do you do that? And she says, well, that's what I learned from my mother. She always did it, and so that's how I do it today. Well, let's go ask mom. Mom, why did you saw off the end of the bone before soaking it in a large pot? Well, that's what I watched my mom do all those years, and if it's good enough for her, it's good enough for me. And the ham was always good. Well, let's ask Grandma then. 
Why did you saw off the bone and the end of the ham each time you soaked it? Well, that's the way I watched my mom do it all those years. It didn't work for her. The ham was always good, and so it must work. Well, let's say we could ask great-grandma why she sawed off the bone and the end of the ham before soaking it into the pot. Great-grandmother, why did you cut off the end of the ham? Well, I had a small pot, and that was the only way it was going to fit. See, through the years, her tradition was handed down without much thought, without questioning why, and the sawing off the end didn't make sense and was necessary. It wasn't really necessary. It was just something that was always handed down, even though through the years the pot became larger in the next generation. And so today, as we're talking about the Methodist toolbox, and we're talking in particular about tradition, we're talking about tradition as another resource, another guide to help us in our theological tradition undertaking. Yes, we're talking about our tradition, the importance of tradition. And it's so important as we discern what does it mean to think about God in the way of Jesus? What it means to be church? What does it mean to be Christian in the world today? What does it mean to be United Methodist in the midst of these perplexing and changing times? And as we talk about this, I'm not inviting us to consider the importance of just keeping time-honored traditions without much thought. Rather, I'm inviting us to give careful consideration to who we are, careful consideration to what's been handed down to us, careful consideration to how we live out our faith and practice our faith here and now. And so I'm inviting us to give careful consideration, yes, of the past, to our history, and hopefully discover something that is rich and packed with meaning as we go way back to the early traditions. See, if we can somehow reclaim those disciplines and practices and the understanding of how God was at work in the gathered community, we would be better off as we seek to renew them and live into them as we go forward into uncharted territories. And yes, the church is very much in uncharted territories. So when I say uncharted territories for the church and as Christians, it means the landscape that is before us is very different than the landscape that we were very familiar with from which we just came. And that is so true in a post-pandemic church. And when 25% of United Methodists have left the denomination with the start of a new one or they've just become independent. So many of the tools and the traditions and the structures that have served us well, they may need to be let go of as we adapt and as we move forward with courage, taking what is essential, what is vital, what is sacred. And so what are we to take with us? We take with us the gospel story. We take the story of Jesus. That's non-negotiable. We take the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the biblical stories that have shaped our faith and our values. We take the Wesleyan emphasis on small groups and the encouragement to have personal holiness but also social holiness and the desire as Christians, to grow in our daily walk, to let our faith become ever so practical in every way that we seek to be like Christ. In the Methodist church, we have our traditions just like other denominations. Every denomination, even non-denominational churches, they have their traditions that they keep. And when I talk about traditions, I'm not talking about traditional worship and, and contemporary worship. I'm not talking worship here, but I'm talking about our history and how in our denomination, theological pluralism has existed from the very beginning. <clears throat> Ashley Draft in her book, Entangled, writes, Theological pluralism is best understood as a living and dynamic theological tradition in which five distinct languages are spoken, including evangelicalism, radicalism, ecumenism, liberalism, and Wesleyanism. There will be a test after the sermon, okay? Theological pluralism was a solution to allowing multiple histories and theologies to coexist in one denomination. And yet unknowingly allow these histories and theologies to do what? To develop into concrete ideologies. And what we started hearing to is one ideology over another. Or these two ideologies can no longer exist in the same denomination. We are a church with a long history, a long tradition of evangelism on one hand, and on the other, a long history of social reform. 
And these two histories have existed simultaneously and have served the church well. And because of this, we have longtime members who are leading us to seek to share the gospel, not just pastors, but people who are going forth and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ in word, sign, and deed. And they believe that, yes, there are other people who need to experience the saving grace of Jesus Christ, and they're calling the church to give witness to that. That's why we exist. And there are other people who are saying, yes, that's why we exist, but also we have got to go to where the people are. We've got to go to the margins, even beyond the margins. We've got to go to those who have felt excluded, and we need to seek to reform society and do the work of justice. Holding on to these two traditions is one of the reasons that we find ourselves at a crossroads when it comes to something like human sexuality for these two traditions that have served us well, they don't always mesh when they become ideologies. And now we feel like one has to win out. It's an either or. When I believe that we're at our best when we have a both and approach and these traditions can continue to serve us as we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and as we seek to meet people wherever they are and we love God and we love our neighbors. All of them. Even though the landscape before us is different than what is behind us, this isn't the first time the church has been at a crossroads. It's not the first time there's been challenging challenges and they decided which way are they going to go. This isn't the first time we've been trying to discern the movement of the Holy Spirit in our midst. For there's a great link between our day and time with that of the early church. And the link is called history and tradition of being church. Ted Campbell, in writing about the interpretive role of tradition, states, we are called to value God's own work through the story, throughout the story of God's people and to take courage and confidence in the faithfulness of God speaking to us in traditions beyond the witness of the biblical story. In the book of Discipline, we read Christianity doesn't leap from the New Testament to the present without, without nothing, excuse me, Christianity does not leap to the New Testament to time's presence as though nothing was to be learned from the great cloud of witnesses in between. And for centuries, Christians have sought to interpret the truth of the gospel for its time. And that's what we're called to do today. See, in many ways, you are Christian or seeking to know Christ because someone in your past cared enough to share the gospel story with you. They passed on the story of God's love, and you were encouraged to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Thank God for this passing down from person to person, from generation to generation, as faith certainly comes by our hearing, comes by the way we share our faith with another. Together, we have received this passing down of faith and the practices through the generations. And yet, what is passed down to us, it's not all good. Sometimes the church has failed. It's not always perfect. We're not a perfect church. See, what's passed down can be a mixture of the good and the not so good as the church has struggled to be faithful has, always, has not always been faithful, as sometimes we have grown complacent or been led by misguided zeal and for some outright lies. As I mentioned last week, when it comes to the interpretation of Scripture, sometimes I get it wrong. In the same way, the church hasn't always gotten it right. See, not all traditions are good traditions. When the United Methodists split over the issue, they weren't united at the time. When the Methodist church split over the issue of slavery and long after the nation came back together, it took 70 years for the Methodist church to once again come together. No longer divided between the north and the south. The nation had already come together. Why did it take so long for the church? Because for 70 years, people recalled their hurt and the animosity toward others. And it took 70 years for healing and renewal to take place. It took a new generation to not be bound by the hurtful past. It's part of our history. And we find ourselves repeating it. 
but hopefully we will learn from this as we face uncertainties and as we discover a way forward with God, even as churches and pastors have left to join the Global Methodist Church in the past year. So when you look back at using tradition as a source, we have to be careful not to glorify every aspect of it or to try to reclaim every part of it. As scripture can be the norm by which all traditions are judged, sometimes the traditions are found wanting in need of redemption. Sometimes we're called to do what? To confess our sin, confess that we got it wrong, and admit where we err and start to seek new life. In renewal. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, didn't seek to start out. I, he didn't say, you know what? I want to start a Methodist church. <laughs> that was not what he was about. Martin Luther, when he, he pinned the thesis to the door, that's not, he wasn't saying, you know what? I've got this great idea. I want to start the Protestant denomination. No, he was trying to reform the church that existed, the Catholic church. Both were trying to reform. They were calling the church to, to go back. Go back to your roots. For John Wesley, he wanted to renew the church of England. And one of the ways they sought to do this was to go back to the early church and see how they lived out their faith. See, Methodism was a revival of the apostolic faith that is expressed in the scriptures. And what do we find in the early church? The Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So as he led this movement with others, this became the model for how he would live in community. Creating societies and bands and classes, we would call them life groups or Sunday school classes or small groups today, where people would get together and hold each other accountable in the way that they were living out their faith. And they would watch over one another in love encouraging one another to live out a faith that is dynamic, that is practical in every way. He renewed the celebration of love feast and, and covenant watch night services and people covenanting together, coming together. He challenged the people called Methodists to spread scriptural holiness across the hearts of many, across the land. In our day and time, in these changing times, As a church is staring at the crossroads, wondering which direction are we going. I'm not saying our church. I'm talking about the United Methodist Church. When we stand at this crossroads, we would do well to remember our roots. To stay connected to the traditions that served the early church and rediscover the early Methodist movement, those traditions. In seeking to renew this in our church today, perhaps we could in some way experience renewal and dare I say revival. Can I say that in this church? Can I say dare we experience revival as we get serious about the message of God's love to all our children being formed ourselves in small groups and watching over one another in love, daring one another to move out of our comfort zones where we might have a tendency to stay and get comfy and cozy with Jesus when Jesus is calling us to go? See, I want us to take risk, not for the sake of the church, but for the sake of those who have yet to come, for those who have yet to hear the story, for those who have gone too complacent or too comfortable and simply are holding on desperately to the status quo. Well, guess what? Holding on the status quo doesn't need to happen. There is no time like the present to be open to the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit bringing forth something new out of something so very old as we seek to move forward in faith. You know, as I think about the interpretive role of tradition and where we are in a church in America, I'm reminded of the prophetic words of John Wesley. And he offered these words closer to his death maybe reflecting upon this movement that he had been part of and seeing the church growing in America and in Great Britain. This is what he says. I'm not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America, but I'm afraid least, lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power. 
And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast the doctrine, spirit, and discipline by which they first set out. So church, what are you willing to renew in your life? Is it a deeper prayer life? Is it joining a small group where you watch over one another in love? Is it being more intentional about worshiping as a couple or as a family or with friends? Is it participation in small groups or a greater willingness to move from a consumer mindset to taking up the cross and following Jesus in acts of service in a life of worship? What do you seek to take with you that will serve you well? And what are you willing to let go of as we together move forward in faith? See, there's no time like today to renew old traditions that serve us well so that we might experience more of God bringing forth renewal in our faith, in our church, in our denomination, in the community in which we live. As we go forth standing firm in the rich traditions, the cloud of witnesses are there and what are they doing? They're cheering us on as we go forth for God and as we go with God. May it be so for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite us now to enter into a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we're thankful for that which we have received from others who are willing to, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with us. We're thankful for parents and for grandparents and aunts and uncles, for, for cousins, for friends, for neighbors, for Sunday school teachers and preachers, for anyone who, who was willing to live out their faith in such a way and a willingness to share the good news with us we're thankful for that witness for that vital witness in our own life and we pray your Holy Spirit will continue to be with your church here at Great Bridge as we seek to do that which had been given to us as we seek to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in word sign and deed as we seek to minister such love to your children empower us we pray O oh Lord to be a church that's seeking to give witness in daily life and may we be very serious with your help with your Holy Spirit leading us to live out our faith but we also pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to lead us to to the margins to minister to people to love people where they are and to offer Christ help us to lift up Christ before any ideology that we might be found faithful in serving you Lord, we recognize our capacity to get it wrong. We recognize our capacity to sin and fall short of your glory. Lord, where we have sinned, where we have fallen short, we ask for your forgiveness. And we seek to be renewed by your grace. Renewed by that call that came at our baptism. To be a disciple who will walk in the way of Jesus. Empower us, we pray, because we cannot do this on our own. Empower us as we gather in Charlotte at a, at a general conference. We pray for the delegates from around the world who are making that journey in a little over a week. Be with them in their discussions. Be with them in their praying. Be with them as they deliberate. But Lord, we trust your guiding hand. May it be upon your church. May we be open to that guiding presence in our life. And Lord, as we come before you, we pray for people on our prayer list and those that we name in our hearts, we lift them up to you. Where there's brokenness and disease, we pray for your healing. For those who are going through rehab we do and treatments, we pray that that would be the means to which they can regain strength and renewal. For those who are experiencing isolation and loneliness, help your church to minister to those in those places and that we might make a difference in the way that we love and the way that we share. And Lord, we come before you. We are troubled by what we see and what we hear about what's going on in Israel. 
in Palestine. We pray, O oh Lord, as tensions rise, that that leaders from around the world would come together and seek your wisdom and dare to be ambassadors of peace. O Lord, continue to walk with your church as we seek to honor you, not only in this hour, but in living out our faith. This we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just want to remind you that we have we uh, our offering today is through um, basket here on the right, and also as you leave the sanctuary, you're certainly welcome to give an offering to God. If you'd like to give online on our website, you can click on there as well and, and to give in that way. But we're so thankful for the ways that we can come together, not only for worship as we go forth to serve, but also as we come together to give and to seek to glorify God in that way as we seek to bear witness to the love of Jesus. And so thank you for enabling that to happen on a daily basis as we seek to be Christ's church. Why don't you stand and sing once more? and 
I don't need to offer a benediction because you just sung it. Uh, but I would encourage us to, if anyone likes to go to have a time of fellowship in the table, there's coffee there. There's an opportunity to gather around tables and share further conversation. If you don't know where the table is, I trust if you follow the masses out that door and take a right and go down the hallway, you'll eventually find the table and ask someone uh, for that. Again, enjoy a time of fellowship uh, with others. Uh, we have come together uh, to share and what a joy it is to be able to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to share our love for God. May we go forth from this place and find meaningful ways to share that love with others. Go forth and may you be at peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.